Should we start, sir, or? Yes, we should start. Okay. So, uh, good evening, all. Uh, I am Ankush Kana from Abbott, Chandigarh. So, first and foremost, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you for joining this session, ECG drills and practices, and I hope that everyone is safe with their beloved ones at their places. So, uh, today it's an honor for us that today we have Dr. Rajat Sharma presently working with Fortis Hospital Mohali as a head of cardiac electrophysiology department. And if I talk about the uh, Dr. Rajat Sharma, so after completing his core cardiology residency from premier institute like PGI MER Chandigarh, after that he pursued an advanced fellowship in clinical cardiology, clinical cardiac electrophysiology from University of Dalhousie, Canada. He specialized in the management of various cardiac arrhythmias or heart rhythm abnormalities. He performs cardiac uh, electrophysiology studies and catheter ablation for management of various cardiac arrhythmias. And his focus area are com complex uh, ablation procedures for management of ventricular tachycardias, atrial fibrillations, and arrhythmias in structural heart disease. So, and implantation of various advanced types of pacemakers and AICDs for heart rhythm disorders and biventricular pacemakers for heart failure patients and pacemaker troubleshooting. And he is member of several international heart rhythm societies like HRS, EHRS, APHRS, and Canadian Heart Rhythm Societies. And if, you, if I talk about the research and publications, so over 100 publications in international journals related to the cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology. Currently a reviewer of prestigious cardiology journal, cardiac catheterization and intervention and involved in few ongoing heart rhythm trials in, in, in uh, international forms. So uh, now Dr. Rajesh Sharma will take us through this uh, interesting and educational uh, program, this ECG drills and practices, Brady chapter two. So uh, over to you, Dr. Rajesh Sharma. Thank you. Welcome, sir. So thank you, Ankush. And welcome everybody for this uh, second round of uh, the drills and uh, practice. Sir. So first time, we had discussed about the bradycardias. So on the 25th, we had discussed about the bradycardia and because of the popular uh, request, so we again revising the bradycardia along with the block. So we'll be covering both the module one and module two. And subsequently the module three will be on the 6th of August. So to start the first module one revision, we'll discuss about the various abnormalities around the sinus node. So we encounter this sinus node abnormalities very commonly, right? But we fail to diagnose this entity because there is no clarity in the ECG when we encounter this ECG with some irregularity in the RR interval. So now look at this ECG and what do you think the mechanism of the block may be? So just to initiate, whenever you look at an ECG, you must try to caliper the PP and the RR interval. So in a normal sinus rhythm, you expect this PP and the RR interval along with the PR interval to be pretty constant. So if you caliper that, then that makes your things life easier. Now, here, if you look at here, in the first two beats, we have a pretty constant PR interval, and we do have a constant PP interval as well. The first PP interval, however, is 104, 1004, 
then there is slight increase in the PP interval. That means something is affecting the SA node. Then if you look at the third PR interval, that is prolonged. And after the fourth P, after the third P, the fourth P did not conduct down. So it is very common to see such kind of ECGs, pretty much post-operative patients or in young kids or young females. If you look at this ECG, something is definitely affecting both the a nodal conduction as well as the as a nodal conduction. So this kind of factor cannot be within the heart. That is a that will be a purely coincidental if it all happens. So when you are dealing with such kind of scenario, rather than just casually telling it the when key back, because there is a PR prolongation and there is a two to one block. It is always better to caliper this and you just try to see that whether our both the atrial and the ventricular intervals are quite normal or not, whether there is some kind of prolongation or shortening and what is happening to our PR interval. Then probably we can make a diagnosis that there is something which is delaying our synodal activation as well as a nodal conduction. So that is commonly a vagal reaction. Now look at this ECG. If you look, sometime you might say it is a normal ECG or something, but whenever you are having some kind of ECGs like this, you have to just devote some time. Now, what do you think here? So now again, in each and every ECG, whether it is a normal, abnormal, always try to calculate the intervals. And more particularly, when you are seeing there is some kind of cluster of the URS complexes in particular zone of the ECG, it is better to caliper so that you can actually make some time sensible analysis. So let us do that. So if you look at the PP interval, they looks pretty constant. I have measured that thing to be 640 millisecond. And if you look at the PR interval, they look pretty much constant. But if you look at the blue line, despite having a normal PR interval, the PP interval actually got prolonged. So it got prolonged from 640 to 1040. The next PP interval again was quite slow, 1040. So we are having a constant PR. That means we are not having any kind of Wenke backing in the AB node. And our PP interval variation between the red and the blue is more than 120 milliseconds. And if you look at the rhythm strip, there is some kind of pattern where the QRS uh, complexes are getting slower and sometimes it is faster. So that typically happens during a respiratory cycle, during inspiration and expiration. So if you are contemplating that the boy is a patient is young, then probably it is a sign of arrhythmia. But if this person is slightly older and this kind of pattern doesn't happen with the respiration, then we call it the non-respiratory sinus arrhythmia. So that non-respiratory sinus arrhythmia is a typical phenomena that can happen in early part of the sick sinus. So whenever you are seeing such kind of ECGs, always try to measure the intervals. Now look at this ECG. It is something pretty much similar kind of ECG, 
but whenever you see an ecg do not try to consider that it is similar you always can calculate the interval let us calculate the interval here so the pp interval looks pretty stable the pp interval i mean pr interval is looking normal and i measured the pp interval here although from a naked eye it looks completely the pp interval looks pretty much regular but it is not that is the reason you need to put a caliper or a dotted line so that you measure this interval correctly because you see this strips don't give you that value so if you look at here the pp interval is gradually shortening from 560 540 520 so the pp intervals are coming closer so the reason for that or the technical term for that we are having a group beating here and we are having a constant pr interval so because of the gradual lengthening of the sinus node activity the pp interval will come closer it is opposite of the av conduction in av conduction we have some reference like the p interval we have and we have the qrs interval but for the sa nodal when key backing or delay we do not have a point from where we can calculate the p wave because in the surface electrogram p is the first wave suppose we put an electrocardiographic catheter right at the sa node possibly we can detect when the sa node gets activated and when the p is formed but those kind of luxury is not there in a surface electrogram so the consequence of that progressive delay in the sa node will eventually cause a clouding of the pp interval there will meaning the pp interval will come closer 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 then after a certain shortening of the pp interval you don't get a p wave that p wave fails to ex exceed so just like that type 2 ab block you have a progressive lengthening of the interval between the pulse generation and transmission we cannot assess the pulse generation time but the pulse transmission eventually is reflected as a shortening of the pp interval followed by a drop bit so this is a type 2 and i mean sa exit block type 2 where there is just a when key backing in the sa node now coming to a more extreme variety what a, it is almost like a similar ecg like the last one here if you look at the pp interval they are pretty regular i mean fixed that means from the sa node to av node the conduction time is the same if you look at the pp interval they are also same so there is no shortening of the pp interval but what has happened in the blue line is it just dropped we did not see a p wave and if you to look at the dropped means the when it did not conduct or did not you do not see a p wave that pp interval is almost exactly the double of the preceding pp interval so it is in multiple of the preceding pp interval that is 640 and we have a 1280 pp interval without a p wave in between that means just like your type 2 ab block here there in type 2 ab block the pr interval is prolonged but it is not sequentially prolonging 
and eventually you have a drop bit without any kind of wanky backing that is a type 2 ab block similarly in sa type 2 ab block you have a fixed pp interval that means there is no wanky backing within the sa node but eventually one of the p wave is not conducted out so that is a more advanced variety of sa exit block just like the ab block i hope it is clear to you so you will have intermittent drop p wave with a constant interval between the impulse generation and the eternal depolarization i think it is very very clear so these are the very important things that you need to see whenever you are looking at such kind of group bit now what is happening here so for a practical purpose if you know the av nodal conduction because most of the people they can diagnose av block quite easily most of the time so a similar principle has to be put to sa block because we think that the sa block is something not discussed too often that is the reason we fail to diagnose it but the electrophysiology electrophysiologically the principle is pretty much the same <clears throat> now what is happening here so do not have that hesitation or the compulsion of tearing right away if you are a smart person you have to put a caliper or you have to just think and you have to see quietly all the intervals then you give a diagnosis <clears throat> so we have a constant pr interval and we do have a constant pp interval also now in between the p did not conduct for two consecutive time so it is slightly an extreme variety of sa exit block now what kind of sa exit block it is is it type 1 no because the pp interval remains constant so there is no wanky backing within the sa node if at all it is it has to be type 2 or maybe a type 3 whether it is a sinus arrest so sinus arrest and a sinus exit block 3 they cause a long sinus pause and sometimes it is not distinguishable whether it is a sinus arrest because of the complete failure of the AC node activation but if you put a catheter in the SA node during the EP study probably you can but how do you differentiate whether it is a type 3 SA exit block or it is a sinus arrest sinus arrest means it is a complete failure of the SA node to depolarize and in type 3 it is depolarizing but it is extremely lousily conducted out to the atrium so in sa exit 3 block you will have multiple f's and p waves but eventually you will have a sinus rhythm and it is not a mandatory to actually distinguish between a sinus arrest or a type 3 sa exit block because pathophysiologically or electrophysiologically they are pretty much the same and the clinical importance of both this category are pretty much the same so this is how the SA node is so we have two groups of cell within the SA node one is responsible for impulse generation the other is responsible for the impulse conduction so impulse generation is done by the P cells and the M cells conducts it out to the atrium so what happens in sinus node dysfunction is there is either failure of the p cells to produce an impulse so in that kind of scenario you will get sinus pauses or sinus arrest but if there is a t cell dysfunction that means the conduction is the problem 
then you will have all those sinus atrial exit blocks. So this is a very common and a very simplified method to understand. Now, when we talk about a sick sinus syndrome, we really don't know what we are meaning most of the time. Whenever we are not able to pinpoint a particular diagnosis, then we call it a sick sinus syndrome or a sinus node dysfunction. But sinus node dysfunction can manifest in various ways. Even if you are looking at a young person or an old person with an extreme bradycardia, sinus bradycardia, I mean, that can be a manifestation of a sinus node disease. So there, the sinus node P cells are activating well, but they are slow. So that can be a sinus node dysfunction. Sinus arrhythmia, just like the one I told you, if it is a non-respiratory sinus uh, arrhythmia, then it is probably a part of that T cell dysfunction. That means there is a part of the SA exit block. Or eventually it can be a T cell dysfunction also. So it will be extremely difficult to say whether in sinus arrhythmia of non-respiratory origin, whether the impulse generation is getting delayed or impulse conduction is getting delayed. And as we discussed, the SA exit block, it, in sinus arrest, it is usually more than three seconds of pause. Even atrial fibrillation with a slow ventricular response is a spectrum of the SA node dysfunction. And we all know about the tachybrady syndrome. So look at this ECG. If you look at the first part of the ECG, any volunteer, Ankush, we'll call some volunteer today. Yes, sir. Sure, sir, sure, we can. Who is going to volunteer? Sir, it is maybe a, a, a offset pose, maybe AF is the... Who is this? Neeraj, yes, sir. Neeraj Kumar, he is a brilliant person. His concept about ECG is great. So, Neeraj, at the first three beats, what do you think? It is some atrial tachycardia. It is a tachycardia with a regular RR or irregular RR? Seems a regular, sir. It is a regular So, probably it is what? It may be a flutter uh, or an atrial tachycardia. Yeah. Then, after the flutter has terminated, then there is no sinus node activity in the form of absence of P wave. And that continues to resume and what? Sinus rhythm or atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation because we don't have a P wave yet. And if you look at the last two beats, there is some P waves here with biatrial enlargement. So what happens in such kind of scenario is, excellent Neeraj, thank you. So this patient was having an atrial flutter. That means there was a rigorous atrial activity was going on through a macro reentrant circuit in the right atrium or the left atrium. And that atrial flutter circuit broke. But the sinus node was so sick, it was completely dependent on the atrial flutter rate. So the sinus node is still sleeping. So after an atrial fibrillation or an atrial flutter terminates, if the sinus node is not active, it is still sleeping, then you can have a terrible pause. You eventually see these things during your cardioversion also. So if you are dealing with a person who has been digitalized or beta blocked or avionodal blocking agent, you have given significantly, they do have an effect on the SA node. Once you cardiovert the patient, then you will be having this kind of disastrous outcome. So you should be ready for all this kind of thing. And this happens particularly in atrial flutter because they are so dependent, the SA node is usually very, very weak and we must be giving a lot of rate controlling medication. So this offset pause, you need to see, suppose this patient would have been in sinus rhythm and there is a pause, 
I won't wait for the 6.2 seconds. But this patient was having an atrial flutter converted to atrial fibrillation. So I can have some kind of patience and the cutoff is five seconds. It is not three seconds, just like in sinus rhythm. So this is an offset pause. So this is a variety of SA pause, SA arrest. Now this, anybody can say probably. So what is the first part of the needed? You can unmute and tell. Sir, atrial fibrillation going so on. The first part is the atrial fibrillation, correct? Because the RR interval is irregular and you do not have a P wave. Then there is a sinus P wave, sinus wave. Then again, the possible initiation of the flutter giving rise to again a significant sinus pause, resuming a sinus node, sinus rate, again, and it atrial fibrillation. So, these are typically a sick sinus disease like a tachybrady syndrome. So whenever you are dealing with such kind of atrial fibrillation or atrial tachycardia, and there is a long pause in between, the cutoff point is five seconds. Unlike the sinus. So, we had discussed all about this during our sleep. What are the kind of arrhythmias that we can detect? So various kind of block pattern that can be seen in a normal physiological state, like in sleeping time, with a sinus pause of more than two seconds are very common. And you can eventually get it at around 10% of the patients. You can have a sinus bradycardia in significant, almost a quarter of the patient who is having a holter test you can have this thing in the sleep. You can have a first degree B block. And in fact, various kind of SA exit block also you can get. So these are very, very physiological kind of arrhythmias. <clears throat> now here is a patient who has a constant PR interval. The PP interval is also the same. And with this pattern of normal PR and PP, eventually the P wave doesn't conduct down. And here, if you look at, there are two P waves for one QRS. So this pattern is called as two to one AB block. Now you will say, why this is not a exit block? Any answer? For an asset exit block type one, you need to have a decrease in the PP interval. For two, you will have absent conduction, but if this PP interval, if you look at, it should be exactly the double. So this is a two to one AV block. What is happening here? Any volunteer? <clears throat> Pankaj, ah, we'll call Rajan. Rajan, unmute yourself and try to tell something about this ECG. And apply the same principle that you have discussed till now. Yes. Uh. So if you look at the first part of the ECG in the top panel, 
If you look at here, the PP interval is pretty stable. And gradually the PP interval prolongs. But if you look at the PR interval, they are pretty constant. So we are not having any delay in the AV node, but we are having delay in the SA node. So what can actually affect the SA node externally? And leading to what has happened here in the third column, you see, after a significant PP prolongation, here you just see the PP has prolonged so much, then you have no conduction in the AV node. There is only P waves. So this is a similar situation like the slide number one. So we are having something which is actually affecting our SA nodal conduction as well as the AV nodal conduction. So what that can be? Minus the drugs. It is a vehicle reaction, right? So if you have ruled out any kind of drug that is affecting both the SA node and the AV node, probably the next diagnosis is the vaguely mediated AV block. Now coming to the AV node. So most of the people, they are quite aware about this AV node disease. So we will quickly go ahead. So if you look at here, there is a PR is prolonged, definitely. Right? So the PR is constantly prolonged. There is no serial prolongation of the PR interval. So probably it is an AB block, type 1 AB block. Now, how it is different from the SA block that we talked about? In SA block, we do not have that luxury of the initial wave. What we see is the final manifestation of the SA nodal activation. But in AV node, we have a proximal wave that is coming as P wave, and we have a distal wave through which the AV node conducts down is the QRS. So we have the two measuring towers to measure the AV nodal interval. But for SA node, we don't have that. So here we have a sinus bradycardia with a first degree problem. So why we call it the sinus bradycardia? Because the sinus node is pretty slow. Now, this is an important thing that you also remember always. Now you are afraid of giving some kind of beta blocker, seeing that SA node or the AV interval has prolonged like 220, 240, 260. That is not going to have any kind of catastrophic effect. And eventually, if you see a person on some kind of beta blocker or AV nodal blocker, non dihydropyridine, calcium channel blocker, comes with a heart block. You must have given beta blocker and calcium channel blocker to many, right? But none of these patients, they come back with a complete heart block or some kind of high grade AV block. So whenever a patient who is on a AV nodal blocking agent manifests with a high grade AV block or a complete heart block, you don't always blame the drug. The drug has actually unmasked the AV nodal disease. If the person has got a robust AV nodal conduction property, until and unless you are giving a supra therapeutic doses of beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, it usually does not block. So you don't always blame the AV nodal blocking drugs for your heart block. Now, the type two AV block or second degree AV block, it has got two components, just like the SA node we discussed about. So, what we are getting here. So if you look at the PR interval, it is progressively prolonging. And after a critical prolongation of the PR interval of 200 millisecond, then this P which came did not conduct down 
to produce a QRS complex. Then once this QRS complex is not generated or a non-conducted P wave, then you resume your sinus node. I mean the AV nodal conduction. So there is a gradual fatigability of the AV node leading to gradual prolongation of the PR interval. Eventually it got tired and slept and then woke up to have a normal conduction. So in the initial phase of the AV nodal disease, you can have this kind of manifestation. And if you look at the ECG carefully, the maximum prolongation of the PR interval will happen between the first and the second beats. So this is the Wenke backing in the AV node, which can be a normal property or which can happen because of a disease. Now, when you look at the such kind of ECGs, there are many form of differential diagnosis will come. So if you are trying to strike out all the differential diagnoses, then probably we can reach to a diagnosis. Now, what is happening here? So let us caliper the thing. So if you look at the things are coming at a group. Right? Now here, what is happening? There is a significant Wenke back because of an possible imperable MI. So this happens. So there is a delayed AV nodal conduction and you can have such kind of Wenke backing around the AV node. Then you will wonder whether it is a type one block or a type two block. So it looks pretty much like a Wenke back. So it has to be a type two Mobius type one AP block. Now there is another variety of second degree AP block which is pretty much fixed. So such kind of fixed blocks are otherwise called as the haze block. So what is happening here? If you look at the PP interval, they are constant. And the PR interval also fixed. Then it follows by a non-conducted P wave. And if you look at the post non-conducted P wave, it is not exactly the double. So you are intermediately having a normal avinodal conduction and one particular time the P wave doesn't conduct down to the ventricle. So it is a type two Mobius block. <clears throat> So what is the basic difference between type one and the type two Mobius block is, in type one, you usually have a gradual Wenke backing. So in type two, there is a failure of conduction. Now in type two, where is the block? Whether it is happening in the AV node or below the AV node. Because in type two AV block, there is no Wenke backing so type two AB block usually a phenomena of a infranodal disease. So that means it is below the AV node. But if you're looking at the type one AB block, it is due to a gradual tiredness or the functional separation of the AV node. So it is happening within the AV node. So when you are encountering a type two AB block, it is due to a structural damage of the conduction system, like a sclerodegenerative conduction system disease, either because of fibrosis, ischemia, and necrosis. So these type two AB block tend to progress because it is an infranodal disease. And if you look at this type two AB block, 
they usually have a narrow QRS. Then you will say how it can be imprahusian. No, I didn't say it is imprahusian. I said it is impranodal. So once it is impranodal, then comes the bundled his. So 75% of these type 2 AB block may be situated within the his. So you will have a narrow QRS. But if it is something distal to that, then you will have a wide QRS exit. So whenever you are having a type 2 exit block, a type 2 AB block in the AB node, you see for the QRS complexes. So whether these QRS complexes are narrow, if it is narrow, then probably you are dealing with a less common variety of type 2 AV block, which is situated in the bundle of his or very close to the AV node. But mostly they will have a white QRS exit. So as I told, like Mobis type 2, it is because of the gradual fatigueness of the AV node. But type 2, it is all or not. Like it will conduct or it will not conduct. There is no anti-back because of the increased disease of the AV node. Now, here we are having the P wave which is not conducting. And if you look at the PR interval, that is pretty much normal. Right? So, whether it is a 2 to 1 AB block or a type 2 AB block or Mobis type 2 AB block. So again, you have to put that thing. So if you look at the RI interval, surround the drop bits. So it should be exactly the multiple of the RI interval. So this we have discussed. Now coming to the fixed type of AB block, like 2 to 1, 3 to 1 AB block. So these blocks are whether they are Mobius type 1 or type 2. So they can be both. So now here is a patient with an imperial world MI probably, and who is having some intermittent P wave which is not conducted down. So if you look at the PP interval, are pretty regular. So, if the PR interval is normal, where do you think that AB block is? If the PR interval is constant, If the PR interval is constant, that means we are not having a Mobis or Wenke backing in the AB node. But the following P wave is not conducted down. And if you look at the QRS complex, they are not white. So I am possibly thinking of a 2 to 1 AB block where very close to the AB node because the Ventricular complex is narrow. So, just like the way we discussed, we need to see for the QRS complex width so that we know. Now, another thing that suppose we have an imprahesian disease imprahesian disease in type 2 AB block or a complete heart block with a wide QRS exit. If you give the atropine, the imprevision block will worsen. So many a times in complete heart block, if you're giving atropine in the therapeutic dose, like 1.2 grams, you can actually deteriorate the patient's AV nodal conduction because the imprevision disease will not respond to atropine at all. But if you are dealing with a bundle branch or a AV nodal 
disease like MYK bat, you can potentially increase the albuminuria conduction. Now here we are having some kind of hidden P waves, three P waves to one QRS. So if you look at the atrial rate, they are pretty high, like close to around 90 beats per minute. And there is an extremely slow ventricular rate because for each three P, Q, P waves, we have one QRS. That is the reason the ventricular escape rate is quite slow. And what do you think about the ventricular escape? It is wide or narrow? It is wide. That means we are dealing with a patient who has a significant infrahesian disease. So in such kind of patients, if you give a natropin injection, then you probably can worsen or without any kind of improvement. Now, sometime, it is why I say it is caliper, that if you look at these two P waves, then there is a hidden P wave here. So you need to try to dig out all these hidden P waves who, who may be hiding in the T waves or the ST segment. So what kind of Mobius type 2 Mobius block it is? Because of the wide QRS, it is not a definitely Mobius type 1. It is possibly Mobius type 2 with 3 to 1 conduction. So the fixed ratio blocks are very, very common and can result either because of the Mobius type 1 or type 2 conduction. So how do you differentiate? By the QRS complexes. Now, many a times we write a high grade AV block. So what is a hybrid, high grade AV block? So whenever the conduction ratio is more than 3 to 1, I mean three P's and one QRS or higher. We call it the high grade. So these are the manifestation of a advanced avinodal disease. I mean infrahesian or hesian disease. So these are the, you just look. So this is a four P waves and a one QRS. So four to one AB block. If you look at the atrial rate, it is close to around 150. And if you look at the RI interval, it is close to 35. <clears throat> now, what is the QRS complex? QRS complex is not narrow. Probably it has got a right, bendular, right bundle branch exit pattern. So there is a disease and which is extending down to the right bundle and the left bundle and probably from the right bundle, the exit is coming. So the QR, this is probably a manifestation of a Mobius type two block with four to one conduction. Now we all know third degree AB block or the complete heart block, but it is not always easy, right? So sometimes you get confused whether it is a two to one AB block or a three to one AB block, then how do you differentiate it? In this ECG, it looks pretty good. Here you have one P wave for one QRS complex, so that becomes easier. But suppose you see two P waves to one QRS, then you are confused whether it is a two to one AB block or not. But here there is a complete AB dissociation that we can know from our blind eyes also. So there is a complete AB dissociation and some of the P waves merge with the QRS and this is a complete heart block. Now, where will be the block? It is a narrow QRS. You just look at, despite having a complete AB dissociation, we have a narrow QRS. That means we are dealing with a very safer variety of a complete heart block where the disease is possibly Hessian or a suprahesian, I mean AB node. So they can be monitored clinically. So this kind of heart blocks you normally see in congenital heart blocks. In young kids, you will have a narrow escape. Now here, there is definitely 
two to one AB nodal conduction or an AB dissociation. So if you just see very casually, somebody may see it is a two to one AB block. No. So you have to just caliper each PP and the RR and you will see that there is a AB dissociation. And some of the P is merging with the QRS complex, distorting the QRS complex. If you look at these two arrows, so these P actually are distorting this QRS complex or we call it a pregnant QRS. So you need to try to see all this kind of invisible P waves, <laughs> then you can make a diagnosis. So in a small kid who comes with his ECG, <clears throat> If the person has a structurally normal heart, but the ventricular rate is less than 55 patient. If the patient has a structurally abnormal disease, heart, if it is less than 70, you pace the patient. And if the child is beyond one year of life with the average ventricular rate of 50 or less, you advise for a pacemaker. Now, what is the level of the heart block? Definitely, we have multiple P waves coming in with few QRS complexes. So AB is dissociated and our QRS escape is wide, right bundle. So I am dealing with the imprehension disease. Now, what is happening here? So when you look at such kind of ECG, this is just like mathematics. So you draw some lines. Sorry. So you draw some line. So this is called a ladder diagram. So from here till here, it is the A, atrial conduction. Then down is the AV node and the ventricle. Now our atrial rate is firing very, very fast. It is the fibrillation or flutter. <laughs> then you look at from below the AV node, the conduction is quite irregular. Then there is some kind of regularity here. So there is a baseline, the patient is having an atrial flutter or a fibrillation. Then the AV nodal conduction is variable, but it is slow and it is regular. Here, if you look at it, it is quite regular. So whenever a atrial fibrillation with a regular ventricular interval, that means we are dealing with a failure of the AV node to conduct down. That means the atrial event is not being conducted to the ventricle and whatever you see in the ventricle channel, they are probably originating below the AV node or below the his. So that can hope happen only in digitally induced complete heart block in atrial fibrillation or patient with a six sinus disease with atrial fibrillation. Now, what is happening here? If you look at here, there are P waves which are conducting down, but it is not producing a QRS complex. So they are getting blocked in the AV node. So because of the block, then from the bundle of his, there is some kind of retrograde conduction and integrate conduction as well, producing the QRS complex. So this is, a complete heart block in patients with atrial fibrillation with an escaped ventricular rhythm. Now, what is the kind of block it is? It is a two to one AV block or it is something. So in between there is two to one AV block. So let us see this. So this is a ladder diagram. So if you do this, that becomes very easy. So this P conducted down to the ventricle, this P conducted down to the ventricle, this P 
conducted down to the ventricle. Then what happened? Something has happened here. This P looks completely different from the sinus P wave. That means it is coming somewhere from the atrium or from the AV node. Then what has happened? Then it has retrogately conducted and excited the atrium, creating an ectopic P, but it failed to conduct down because by that time the integrated propagation was already happening. So this is a P wave coming from AV node or low left atrium or right atrium blocking the integrated conduction. So this is a his extra systole or systole from the atrium blocking the integrated conduction. So you might feel that kind of thing is a two to one AV block. So you have to caliper those things. Now here, we have a group beating here. The PP interval in the initial two is pretty normal. Then it shortens. That means there is a what? PAC is there. That is the reason the P came prematurely. So let us put a um, the, uh, letter diagram. So this third or the fourth P did not conduct down. So that is a block PAC. So this amount of minuteness you should have to diagnose this kind of simple looking two to one AB block or whatever block you say. So it is very, very important to put your caliper. Now, if you look at here, the P wave and the QRS complexes are merging of their own, but at the same rate. So this is a isoarrhythmic AB dissociation. So they are quite physiological kind of AB dissociation. They can happen in post-surgically or in hypervagal states because of the decreased AV nodal conduction. They usually recover. Like if you so see in the first four bit, there is an isoarrhythmic AB dissociation, but subsequently the AV nodal conduction has improved and you see distinctly the PR and the P and the QRS complexes. So this is about the SA node a AV nodal block. Just to wrap up the today's talk, I will just quickly go to the fascicular blocks, which is very commonly seen. So what are the fascicles? When I'm talking about the fascicle, that means the anterior fascicle and the rib, um, uh, posterior fascicle of the lip bundle. And very commonly you see these blocks. So they manifest just like some kind of QRS prolongation or widening of the QRS complexes. So various kind of fascicular blocks you can see. So the anterior fascicles come anteriorly and the posterior fascicles come posteriorly. So when you are having a AV nodal conduction, the conduction actually happens through the anterior fascicle anteriorly. So then it goes to the posterior fascicle. So now you can encounter such kind of ECG and you can just tell that it is probably a right bundle branch block, atypical. Then you have to monitor many things. So in a pure left right bundle branch block, you should have a normal QRS, the normal axis. But if you look at here, it is an superior axis or left axis. There is an increased QRS voltage in the limb leads. And the QRS voltage is not very, very prolonged. It is lesser than 120 milliseconds. And if you look at the other manifestations, like you have small Q waves with the tall R waves in lateral leads like one and AVL and maybe V5, V6. So if you are dealing with a left anterior fascicular block, what will happen is your anterior fascicle is not conducting. So this vector, the initial vector from the left bundle is blocked or it is delayed. And the second vector, which is conducted mostly 
posteriorly and laterally and superiorly is more permanent. So what do you get? So suppose this is a AV, this is the bundle of heaves and the vesicles. So in left anterior fascicular block, what will happen is the impulse is conducted to the left ventricle predominantly by the posterior fascicle because your anterior fascicle is blocked. So this posterior fascicle is actually attached to the inferoceptal wall in the endocardial surface. So what will happen is the initial vector will be just downwards and rightwards. So if it is downwards and rightwards, it will produce a tiny R wave in 2-3 ABA because it is going towards the inferior part and it will produce a Q wave because it is going away from one end ABA. Then the major depolarization force will be upward and laterally because of the posterior fascicular conduction. So it will produce what? A prominent positive deflection in the lateral leads. Like you will have a giant R wave in the left sided leads like V5 to V6. And in the precordial leads or the inferior leads, you will get deep S waves because it is going away from them. And because of the prolongation of the depolarization time, you will have close to around 20 milliseconds delay in the stimulation of the left ventricle that prolongs the QRS interval. So this is how you diagnose in left anterior fascicular block. I think with this, we'll end this talk today. We'll not discuss about the posterior fascicular block. So any questions from the audience? Uh, so uh, thanks Dr. Rajat. So and next time we'll be meeting in the 6th of August where we'll be discussing about the tachyarrhythmias. Uh, so uh, Dr. Rajat, uh, so it was very nice and informative presentation. And I'm sure that the participant has also find it useful. So we have learned uh, uh, a lot about the kind of blocks are there and also learned the right ways to interpret the blocks to provide accurate or better treatment to the patients. So in the interest of time, so we will take the, I mean, one or two questions from the chat box. So there is uh, one uh, question from Dr. Kulvinder that there is a patient with a heart rate around 45 to 50 with shortness of breath. So pacemaker required. So uh, yeah, Dr. Rajat, uh, your uh, opinion about that? No, let me go and uh, answer his every question. Right. Okay. So Hasnain said, thank you very much for allowing everyone to gain knowledge. Thank you. And uh, So many uh, audience actually, they have given their email. Can we have any, any idea how to freeze this email so that we can communicate later? So uh, Dr. Rajat, already I have, uh, you know, jot down all the email IDs. Like Dr. Nibedita, she was my senior. Yeah, yeah so I have already- From Data Steel. Yeah, already I have jot down all the yeah. email IDs. And where is the question? Oh, okay. Patient with a heart rate around 45 to 50 beats per minute with shortness of breath, breath, pacemaker required or not? So this is an excellent question, Dr. Kulvinder. Now, how do you assess this patient? I hope this heart rate is a sinus heart rate because if it is a complete heart block, then we are not discussing anything because if the patient has a complete heart block, 
and patient has a wide QRS escape, that means we are dealing with a very progressive infrahistian conduction system disease. So here we are not going to argue any kind of discussion. <clears throat> Suppose a patient comes to you with a sinus rate of 45 or 50 beats per minute, and this person is having a shortness of breath. So by the clinical knowledge of shortness of breath means we are dealing with a patient who is chronic, chronotropically incompetent. That means whenever the patient is doing some form of physical activity, the sinus node doesn't pick up. That probably is the reason why the patient gets tired and exhausted. Now, for such reason, if you put a pacemaker, then you need to understand that you are going to explain the patient why you want to put the pacemaker. So your documentation has to be good so that you are not criticized by anybody. So how you are going to prove that? So if the patient is able to do some form of physical activity, then probably you will put the patient to a Montbrus protocol. And depending on the age, you would just calculate the chronotropic incompetence index or called as a CI. So if the CI is something significantly lower, then probably the patient has got a chronotropic incompetence. So that may be a spectrum of the six sinus disease. So in your diagnosis, you'll write, the patient has got a chronotropic incompetence with a six sinus disease, and we put a pacemaker. And for a six sinus, because there is a remote possibility of a abunodal disease also, it is always better to put a dual chamber pacemaker. So, so these are some comments from the stressings actually. And uh, any other questions? Uh, so, Dr. Rajat, there is one question from Dr. Rakesh. So, need a little bit more clarity on sinus arrest and sinus exit block. The sinus exit block and sinus exit. Perfect. So, Dr. Rakesh. Sinus arrest means there is no atrial, means no impulse being generated by the SA node. Now, the sinus arrest and the SA arrest type 3 or exit block type 3, where there is a prolonged delay in the P wave conduction, they are not indistinguishable based on the ECG. But they are trying to give some kind of definition for sinus arrest. So electrophysiologically, SA exit block 3 and sinus arrest are the same. Suppose you are dealing with a patient with a fixed PP interval and then you don't see any atrial activity. I mean an isoelectric line. That means there is no impulse generation from the SNO. Now, some of the electrophysiologist or authority, they say when you don't have a P wave for three seconds, I mean the RR interval is three seconds, then you call it sinus arrest. But whether that is a sinus arrest or a sinus arrest, sinus sinoatrial exit block three, that is meaningless. So whatever we are dealing with is an advanced sinus sinoatrial exit block or a SA arrest. So just to give a name to our SA arrest, we just say when the R interval is more than three seconds, there will be meaning that there is no. SA nodal activity in the surface ECG for three seconds, we call it the SA arrest. The meaning is the same, like you have no SA nodal depolarization, which is exiting out, depolarizing the atrium for a significant amount of time. I hope Dr. Rakesh that is clear or Yeah, uh, 
She got a text from Dr. Rakesh. That nice explanation, Dr. Rakesh. Thanks. There is a new message. So I think we have taken all the questions from the chat box, uh, Dr. Rajat. Yeah. So final uh, comment from your side to closing this session. My final comment is: whenever you look at an ECG, don't ever think that. I am going to stun everybody by telling that this patient has an acute myocardial infarction, ST elevation, T wave inversion. There are many more things beyond that. So, in a normal ECG, also you try to spend five minutes. That is an important document. It is almost like a Sudoku, right? It will stimulate your brain. You will not grow old. Suppose each and ECG that you touch, and you put. Your caliper or your scale, and measure each and every pre-interval. You are actually constantly stimulating your brain, and you are analyzing. So you will never grow old, and you will never make mistake. So the person who reads the ECG the best, they probably are considered as the most smartest physician in the community. So you believe that. So. For an anti-aging activity, you just try to enlarge your ECG each and every time. Yeah, uh, yeah, Doctor Ajit. So you have uh, brought very valid point in our minds. You, you know, you spend more time on normal ECG also. I think the concluding day will be most exciting, where we'll be putting on very nice ECGs, and everybody will be open. So it will be a gala night and. Everybody will be given some kind of score. <laughs> so, Sorry, yeah. Gold coin. So I think now we close this session. So uh, I would say thanks to uh, all of you to joining this session and taking out uh, you know time from your busy schedule. So enjoy Thursday night. We'll see you in next session in next month. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Rajan.